today is May 11th. It is 2018. It is Mother's Day. Uh, before we are done here today, Elder Charlie will share. Uh, Elder Baj will share. Pastor Wade will share. Pastor Matthew will share. This church is about to get right. Our message topic today is called Generations That Are Stirred, Not Shaken. Let's go to Genesis 17. We're going to begin in verse 7. Say there when you're there. 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 Hallelujah. Y'all doing okay today? (laughs) I love the zeal in this house. We're a high energy ministry. It can be difficult when you first show up here, the pace that we run. It seems strange. I want to encourage you that we're turning out ministers that are finer than I've seen anywhere, ever, even in our previous years. The Christian life is a busy life of pouring out, reaching places where you think you have nothing left to give so that the Lord can fill you and you know what you're giving had to come from Him. The Christian life is not a life of ease and comfort. As any mother will tell you about raising children. In Genesis 17, in verse 7, let's pick up with our first topic today. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. Do you hear how God is making Abram a party to his covenant, but he is also making descendants not yet born a party to the covenant. God is a generational God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he called you, he was also calling all who will ever come from you. He intends for you to be the starting place for the work of God in your family line for generations to come. He goes on to say in verse 8, the whole land of Canaan where you now, uh, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. I will be their God. When we bear children and we raise them in the way that the Lord has called us to, we can be sure that our God will be their God. That is a beautiful promise. If we start a child in the way that he should go, if we train him or dedicate him in the way that he should go, he will not depart from that way, even when he is old. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. The faithfulness of one generation stirs up the faithfulness of the next generation. When we hold to the principles of the Lord and live in his fire and live in his life and live in love with him, Our children learn to live in love with Him. And this is the only life that they will ever know. In Exodus 17, we were in Genesis 17. Now we go to Exodus 17. Verse 16. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Ever since the garden where we have Cain's descendants and we have righteous Seth's descendants, there have been generations of righteous raising up other righteous people. There have been generations of wicked that are spreading their wickedness. I don't have to tell you which generation propagated the fastest. Which one went into polygamy first? Which one went into murder first? Which one went into idolatry first? You can look around you and see that truth. But God says to the people who have lifted up their hands to His throne, who are not trusting in their own hands, they're submitting their hands to the throne of God. I want you to know something. I will be at war with those generations of the wicked. We will convert them, or we will bring them in the kingdom, or I will deal with them at the judgment. But God from generation to generation stays consistent in this manner. This is why he says in Leviticus 17. You see what we did there? Genesis 17, Exodus 17, Leviticus 17. In Leviticus 17, 7, he says, They must no longer offer any 
of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. This is to be a lasting ordinance for them for the generations to come. How long is there a prohibition on idolatry? Forever. Forever. For the generations to come. From the very beginning of the biblical story, we have a separation between light and darkness. We have God bringing order to chaos so that he can cause more life to abound. And everything gave birth according to its kind. You righteous women in here, you can be sure that your faith will be possessed by your children if you stand fast in faith. Because everything gives birth According to its kind. It takes God to change a kind. Took me from a wicked family line and made a righteous family line out of me. Amen. That's the way that we want to see things go, isn't it? We have reasons for confidence this morning. I want to show you what God does to his generation. This is the generation that came out of Egypt and would go into the promised land in Deuteronomy 32. We're going to pick up in verse 9 and this will constitute the theme of what we're speaking about today. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 9. For the Lord's portion is His people. Have you ever considered that you are God's inheritance? God Himself has purchased you. God himself has purchased all who will come from you. He has given his life as a ransom for the generations of your family. You have a duty to the Lord and a duty to those generations to see the faith that he has shown you travel down through the generations. Your children's children's children are the Lord's inheritance. And they are also your crown. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. In a desert land, he found him. The word Devarim, that this is the Hebrew word for this book, means in the desert. It was in the desert that God gave his word to his people, and he reminds them of that often. Friends, if you're in a dry place today, the Lord has been speaking to people in dry places for a long time. If you're in pain today, he's been speaking to people who are in pain for a long time. If you were poor or broken or captive, he has been rescuing people just like us for a long time. In fact, they have a harder time hearing him in the palace than they do the prison. The truth is, is he likes to speak in the desert. Because when he brings something to life in the desert, everybody knows who did it. Can I tell you he's going to bring life from here? Everybody who wants it can have life today. I believe the Lord's going to do a new thing here. He's going to continue something in a bigger and bigger way. And I want to show you that. In a desert land, he found him. In a barren and howling waste, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Apple of his eye is a Hebrew euphemism for your pupil. You might let somebody come up and shake your hand. In a church like this, You might let somebody come up and hug you and you might hug them. I myself am a hugger. Ever since God changed me from a violent man into somebody who loves, I hug everybody. I even like it if you don't really want to hug me. I don't usually give you a choice and that makes it more fun for me. But the most gentle among us is not going to let someone walk up and poke them in the pupil of their eye. God is saying that is the extent to which his careful watch is on you. Just like a man would guard the pupil of his eye, he is guarding after you. Can I tell you nothing that has happened to you in your life has escaped his notice? Your situation right now, your concerns right now, he's aware of. He's concerned about. He is guarding you. Look at verse 11. Like an eagle. Somebody say like an eagle. Like Like is a word in English. That indicates a simile or a metaphor. It's exactly the same way in the Hebrew. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on its pinions. God guards you and he watches over you. 
But he does something else. He stirs up the nest. The Lord is not interested in you sitting and soaking. He's not interested in you listening to a sage on a stage as your responsibility. He is interested in hovering over you. This is what he did with Mary that produced such life in her. He's interested in you positioning your life in such a way that he can quite literally stir you up. Hebrews 12, 28 says we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Your life cannot be shaken, but it can be stirred. When you feel rumblings, when you feel difficulties, when you feel tossed one way or another, it's not you about to fall. It's God waking you and stirring you because he wants to produce something from you. I remember when these feelings began to stir in my wife. All of a sudden, pregnancy magazines started to show up. An obstetrics book showed up in my house. I'm like, that's interesting. I'm kind of slow. It took me a while to perceive her intentions. But she made it clear to me later. And the result was Judah Benjamin Stevens. God spoke to us and told us that we were going to have a son. Over time, he revealed to us what his calling would be. Do you know why? Because what is a surprise to us is not a surprise to him. The trial is not a surprise, and the reward after the trial is not a surprise. He's got a careful plan for you. He might be stirring you like an eagle stirs the chicks in the nest because he wants you to take flight. He wants you to soar higher and higher. He wants to lift you up and not knock you down. He wants to reach down and grab you by the hand and raise you up to the heights that he flies at. Our king does not show interest in audience. What he shows interest in is actual discipleship. In Hebrew, you become like your teacher. This is why Jesus himself said, you will do greater works than I did. Everything that he did in his ministry was to stir people to action, to stir them so that they could accomplish the very things they saw him accomplishing. Go with me to Isaiah 42. Say there. Branchy, it's good to see you in the service, man. That's going to be a fine man of God right there. Growing up speaking Bahasa Indonesian, English, devastatingly handsome. No telling what's going to come from that little life. In Isaiah 42, verse 13, the Lord's not asking you to do anything that he doesn't do to himself. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. Come on now, you ever stirred something up in a bad way? I come from backwoods, Louisiana. They'd say, if you stir it up, it's going to follow you around. Or, don't start none, won't be none. Sometimes, you can meditate on a thought. You can let it roll around in you until you're angry where you weren't angry before. Sometimes you start to feel a sense of injustice That you didn't have before. You ever had somebody put their injustice in you? Like, hey man, do you see the way he treated us? No, what's wrong? Oh yeah, when he looked at us, you, you know what he was thinking. And before long, you're angry and you weren't angry before. This is a negative example of stirring up. But God is like a mighty warrior stirring up his zeal. God is meditating on his plans for you. He's meditating on the war with Amalek. He's meditating on what he wants to come from your life. He has your best interest in mind. Anybody ever changed their 12th diaper in a day? I mean, when those things say 35 pounds, that's about all they'll hold is 35 pounds. I was shocked that you have to change diapers. I thought one would make it a whole day. It doesn't. I want to stop feeding my kids so I'd stop changing diapers. And the first one is the most discouraging of all. Whatever my conium is, it came from the pits of hell, not the bowels of the child. It resembles a melted tire and it fights back. 
My wife could clean up the BP oil spill with a single wet wipe. I needed 735 wet wipes for every urinary explosion. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise a battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. You need to not just picture God, picture our King Jesus as a lily white Viking with a a fluffy sheep around his neck. The world loves Psalm 23 Jesus. It's it's a little bit fictitious. He was brown skinned. He had brown eyes. He looked nothing like the Jeffrey Hunter movie. And in the midst of this, we get the idea that he's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. But what happens in Exodus is he's a warrior. What happens in Isaiah is he is a warrior. And the lion of the tribe of Judah is coming back for his pride. It, pride meaning us. He is not just the um, guy who sells marshmallows. He is a warrior. He stirs up his zeal. And look what he compares that to. Verse 14. For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. I gasp and pant. Joy Dang gave birth on Thursday. She got a broken tailbone. She's in extraordinary pain right now. But she's a warrior. In this church and in the faith of the living God, we have embraced masculine holiness. We don't think masculinity is toxic. We think it is actually the answer to the world's problems. We've embraced holy masculinity. If you look at the Hebrew resh hef mem, these three letters in a row, this word describes God, uh, R-H-M, and it is compassion. But the Hebrew is actually woman-like. It's even a little more specific than that. That's not because God is a woman. It's because when a woman acts godly, then it is a characteristic of God. And what we see in this church is the men and the women in every way excelling in godliness. It's beautiful. When God wants to express his wrath towards the enemy, he says, you're about to hear me cry out like a woman in childbirth. Now, why would that be an expression of war? Because the children that come from the women in this room are going to step on the head of the enemy. That's why. Because we are not powerless housewives. We are not people who are simply living in some arcane existence with a male authority above us dictating all that we do. We're actually living in a beautiful flow of shalom with a man who is desperately trying to follow the Lord and a woman who is desperately trying to follow her husband. And together, they make a pretty good team. And their children will learn from the father what Jesus is like. They will learn from the mother what the role of the church is like. And they will go to war with the enemy. My children, from the time they were little, were as bad as your kids. But... They also had something else at work in them. I might get a call from school that said one of them knocked out another kid or was knocked out by another kid. But I also might get a call that said they prayed for somebody in the class in front of everybody and there was a healing or witnessed to the teacher or sat and boldly testified to the baptism in the Holy Ghost to a kindergarten leader. It was our job to work in them and through them. Our job to plant the word in them, to remind you, to put it on the door frames of our houses, to put it every, we had to stir something up. The world's trying to stir something up that doesn't belong. We're trying to stir up that which does belong. And it starts with a very personal stirring in you. You know, when you're on fire for the Lord, what you produce, children that are on fire for the Lord. We don't need to consider any alternatives, do we? Because that's where this church is headed. Go with me to Haggai. Haggai, the first chapter. And the 13th verse. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you. Oh my goodness. 
Is there anything that could be better? Whether you're in childbirth or you're getting fired from your job. Whether you just found out the worst news or the best news. Is there anything that compares with knowing that God is with you? He, He is with those who love him. He's attentive to their their needs. He's attentive to their concerns. Psalm says he watches from on high and considers everything that they do. Oh, church, nothing in your life has escaped his notice. The message of Haggai was, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. Zerubbabel had an impossible task before him. He literally had to build a house for God. What's worse is the generations before him did wicked things that caused one to be torn down. And somewhere in the past, do you know how we romanticize the past? Everything was better in the past. That's because you're not in it anymore. That's why you feel that way. He had to compete with the idea that Solomon built a wonder of the world. And now he had to go out and he wondered, did he have what it takes? Oh, come on, mamas. How many days did you wonder if you had what it took to finish raising your child? I know. I know the truth. Most days you feel like a failure. Most days you wonder if you're accomplishing anything. So the Spirit of the Lord, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. The answer to our problems is not self-deprecation. It's not better parenting books from Dr. Spock. Man, did that ruin a generation. It is stirring up the Spirit of the Lord within you. And as you stir up the Spirit within you, something begins to happen to your children. You will notice they are kneeling beside you praying. You will notice one day they're baptized in the Holy Ghost and you didn't even see it happen. You will notice that they are becoming what you already are. And the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people, they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. Notice what's happening here is so beautiful. God has looked at his people who he cares very much for, just like you. He sees an awesome task before him. For some of you beautiful young ladies, it might be, Waiting and trusting that God will bring along the right husband. The one that's full of the Spirit of the Lord and not full of spirits that come from a bottle. For some of you young men, it might be that you don't go to IGaveUp.com or ChristianBootyCall.com or whatever they're advertising to you lately. And you are waiting for God to bring you the woman of God just like he brought a woman straight to Adam. And yet the scripture says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Do you know why? Because men are really unobservant. And God will put them right in their life and you're like, oh, wow, that is pretty good. You might be sitting, yeah, well, let's not do a dating service. So the point being, When you have an awesome task before you, like building a house, and you don't know if you have what it takes to do it, the Spirit of God will begin to move in you. He'll begin to stir in your heart. If you let Him, He'll cultivate faith in there that will grow, and everybody around you will take encouragement from it. It's a whole lot better than cultivating depression alone in your room, isn't it? You know, Bluebell makes you feel good for about six minutes, seven minutes. Then you get a brain freeze, And then you have to buy new blue jeans. It'd be a whole lot better to worship. It'd be a whole lot better to stir up the spirit that is within you. The Holy Ghost is all we have ever needed. We don't need more money. We don't need more fame. We don't need better clothes or popularity. What we need is to be stirred up in the Holy Ghost. Do you want to be stirred up? Yes. Oh man, there is a generation of people who lost the stirring of the Lord. They get exactly one verse today. It's Judges 2, 10. And that's all we're going to talk about. They're just not worth mentioning any more than that. Say there when you're in Judges 2, 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up. 
who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. When one generation drops the ball, do you know what we end up with? The time period of the judges. What they failed to do was stir up the spirit that God gave them. They failed to work themselves or fan themselves into a holy frenzy. They lost the zeal that they began with. Like Ephesus, but not receiving the word, they departed from their first love. Ephesus heard the rebuke and made it. The point is that we must stir something holy in us. And when we stir something holy in us, it will stir something holy in those that we are responsible for and God has given us. When a generation fails, here is what the Lord does. It comes from Psalm 22. You can turn to Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, we see the words of Jesus over and over and over coming prophetically out of the psalmist a thousand years before Jesus was alive. It's incredible the accuracy. But by verse 30... He begins to comment on him rather than speak his actual words. And in verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. For he has done it. I want you to understand if something has been dropped in your life. If something was dropped in the generation before you, if you were scared that you might drop it in the generation to come, we have an advocate. We have one who has come and he has said, posterity will serve me. Future generations will be told about me. When mankind lost it, God entered mankind and said, I will fix this. You are the solution to a problem. You are grafted in to solve a problem. Your zeal and love for the Lord are meant to stir the generations that grew cold. He chose for you, posterity, to serve Him. He came before us and yet we spend every day at present talking about Him. Our futures are determined based on what He has and is saying to us. We are the future generations that are serving Him. And He is stirring us up for that purpose. In Matthew 21.10, Jesus entered Jerusalem. The whole city, somebody say "whole whole city, was stirred and asked, who is this? When a generation goes awry, He enters into it. When your situation goes awry, He will enter into you. And if you let Him, He will stir you to success. If you feel shaken this morning, that shaking can turn right into a stirring. It doesn't have to be shaken for your crumbling. It can be a stirring for your rising to be with the Lord. It can be a stirring that raises a dead man into a living man. It can be a stirring that takes somebody and makes him an ambassador of Christ. Jesus didn't show up in Jerusalem to condemn Jerusalem. He showed up there to stir up the men who would tell his story for generations to come. And by the way, of all the things Jesus did, what is most stirring to you? His level of sacrifice. Isn't that why you love your mother? When you are very small, you have no idea what she did for you. You have no idea that your existence is selfish at every core. You know, you cry because you want to be fed when you're very little. You cry because you want to be changed. Mom showers affection on you, and she waits for the day that you learn to reciprocate that. In that way, a mother is very much like the love of our God. He showers His affection on us, giving us rain in its season, giving us food, the created order of things here so that your life can exist. And He waits for the day that you respond to that affection. But what a beautiful day when your children responded to you. The first time you heard, I love you, mommy. You're pretty, mommy. When when I get older, mommy, I want to marry you. See, they need direction. My boys wanted to marry their mother. I said, we left the state who does that. (laughs) Let's go to Luke 23. Abraham left her of the Chaldees. Hey, Luke 23 in verse 4. You there? 
Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for the charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and he has come all the way here. Even at Jesus' trial, they were complimenting him. They just didn't know it. All over Judea, the presence of this righteous man stirred the crowds. God put you in your home to stir it up. He made your body his home to stir you up. And he put your home in the nation that you're in to stir it up. The living God does not want you to be shaken. He quite literally wants you to be stirred. Flip over to John 5. This will get real. When you reach John 5, discover and land on the second verse. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, a pool, which in the language of the Hebrews is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that he had been in this condition a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Man, that's a profound question, isn't it? And yet we meet people all of the time that know that the way that they're living is crippling them, that know that sin in their life is destroying them. And we ask, do you want to repent? You know, I, I don't know. How many marriages has it cost you? How many relationships has it cost you? How many sleepless nights has it cost you? How many Monday morning hangovers has it cost you? But you're not sure they want to get well. So Jesus asked him a legitimate question. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. Lord, I, I can't do it. See, I've been this way so long. How many years? 38 is a long time, isn't it? I've been this way so long, you just don't get me, Lord. You don't understand me. This is, this is how I am. Maybe that's why he included how long it had been. So that you would remember that no, how longer, no, no matter how long you have been the way that you are, with a touch from the master, it can change in a moment. Are you fond of saying, well, it's been this way always, so it's going to be that way? Because this is life-changing ministries, not life-justifying ministries. You know, what your heart wants, your mind tends to justify. So you can talk about your disabilities. You can talk about all of the things that are holding you back, that are out of your control, so that you're just some kind of cosmic victim. But I believe that you're a part of the victorious church of Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that you don't even need somebody to stir these waters. This man is quite literally waiting on an angel from heaven. The Textus Receptus includes a passage here that says, from time to time, an angel would show up and he would stir the waters. Oh man, how nice is it when heaven reaches down and touches the earth. But I want to encourage you. He's already touched the earth. He's already poured out his spirit. He's already deposited himself in many of you. You don't need an additional stirring from heaven. Heaven is waiting on a man on the earth to stir it up so that it reaches heaven. He's waiting on somebody to stir the waters and he's supposed to be stirring them. Jesus goes on and does for him what he doesn't believe he can do himself. But I want to tell you that the spring that is inside of you, it is not only welling up to eternal life. It's welling up to overflowing in a way that stirs the waters for everyone around you to get healed. Beginning with your family and moving outward. You have become a kind of vortex fountain. I found such a thing on YouTube because everything is on YouTube. I want to show you this. Sound is unimportant.
This is not rising or not descending from heaven. It is rising from something that was planted on the earth. Rising and rising and soon it will reach the place of overflowing. This is what your spiritual walk was intended to look like. Jesus Christ put that fountain in you. And you are supposed to stir it up until it ever widens and ever widens and ever rises. Until it overflows to everyone that is around you. And I'm here to tell you that you can do that. You can do that, and many are attempting it now at every turn. This is the power of a holy life. Do you know how we say mother in Hebrew? M. It's paleo in the way that, that Moses wrote it. It's comprised of an aleph and a mem. Its, its definition is strong water. See, The first place in life that a child enters the world obviously is through the waters of his mother's womb. He learns about sacrifice and selflessness from her. It is her who begins to stir in the child a holy love for the Lord and a father who helps direct that path. You are a source of life because Jesus has put himself inside of you. You have the ability to change the environment of your whole household. This is attested to by redneck prophets everywhere. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Well, what if mama is happy? What if mama is full of the Holy Ghost? What if mama is a veritable explosion of life? Well... Well, then she's stirring up her household and maybe dad will stand up and lead in the way that God's called him to lead. You know what? We'll change the world when that happens. We got to stir it up, saints. When you think of being stirred, you might consider another passage that you see as heaven down and I believe as earth up. It's 2 Kings 2 in verse 1. Say there. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. A water vortex. Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Now you know what precedes this. Elijah had tried for revival. His revival didn't happen in the way that he wanted. He faced down the prophets of Baal. He ran from a woman named Jezebel. And he laid down under a broom tree and wanted to die. He finally says, I'll go back to the cave where God spoke by Sinai. He heads all the way back and God says, what are you doing here? Um, came to meet with you. You think you have to go to a special cave to do that? Hey, leave here right now. And go get Elisha, your successor. One generation has the power to impart something to the next. And when we take that seriously, Elijah's seven miracles that are recorded in the word become 14 miracles in Elisha's life. The successor always goes past the predecessor because the way that God builds is greater in every generation. Your job, mamas, your job, daddies, is to start something that your children further way beyond you. They should surpass you in every way. Elisha surpassed Elijah, but we consider Elijah the greatest of the prophets. Do you know why? Because he did his job. We don't know who Elisha's successor was. But we know that Elijah did his job. It showed in Elisha. You see the whirlwind. The chariots of fire is coming from heaven. Picking him up and taking him back to the heavens. I see him stirring up such a holy fire on the earth. That it caused him to rise into the heavens. There was never a time those chariots of fire were not with him. There was never a time the holy fire of God was not being stirred up in him. And it just like that fountain in the video rose and rose and rose. Until he went to be with the one that he was like. 
He was extending heaven into the lives of the people around him. So he really just had a change of physical location. But his activities were exactly the same. Church, you can experience heaven on earth now. You can cause a memorial to rise from you through the generations like righteous Cornelius who we all owe our salvation to. And it will rise before the Lord day and night. Bigger in every generation. There are a few slides that I want to show you as we get ready to dedicate babies and hear from our elders. The first says Toliadot. This is Strong's number 8435. There's two basic ways to say generation in Hebrew. Toliadot is really, it's cognate in Greek is Genesis. It means origins. It's the history of something created. It's the chronological procession. So when we're counting generations to say, is it 80 years? Is it 40 years? Is it 20 years? Well, it depends on what you're counting from and to. That's Toliadot. But it's not the only Hebrew word that there is. The next one in our next slide is Strong's number 418. It's dur. Dur is a word that is driven from circular fashion. In other words, when Hebrews would pour something onto the ground and first one grain hit, then two grains, then three, then ten, then fifty, then a hundred, and the pile was increasing in size. They called that a dur. They saw generations as starting with you, but successively growing outward and upward in their influence. In fact, the great debate over Matthew 24, is, this generation will not pass away. Entirely depends on what Hebrew word Jesus had in mind here. Because they're both replaced by one Greek word. And we won't get into that debate today. My point in showing you generations is that they're building to something. Let's go to that next slide. Consider the first... Wow! Um, that's small. I'll read it to you. Considering the first ten generations, what you see on the screen, or we'll have to use like Braille to get is each man's name successively in the generations the definition of the man's name and I put the source material for you so you knew how to find it and we will upload it after the message for you if you read Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah in Hebrew their names have meaning just reading the meanings of the name then Man was granted or compensated with mortality by the owner, possessor, and purchaser, the blessed God who descended, initiating his death brings strong, powerful comfort and rest. Do you hear a story in that? If you stopped in any generation, the story wouldn't be complete. In fact, the story becomes more complete as you get to the 10th generation. Can you imagine if you don't have Noah? Then he's bringing a strong, powerful, what, judgment, uh, uh, salvation, uh, discipline, uh, comfort. I mean, we wouldn't know. See, your story's not complete yet. And you don't know how it's going to finish. You're going to trust the Lord to show you. This is the first genealogy in the Bible. As we go through these, they get better and better. In fact, the 30 generations, which I don't have time to read you all 30, will just take um, the first in the tenth. When you look at these, in the first line where we have Adam and then the tenth, Noah, God used Adam to start the human race. You can see uh, under Adam, he used Shem to begin the Semitic peoples. Isaac to begin the inheritance and the messianic line of the faithful. But ten people from them in every case. Noah had to redeem the human race. Abraham had to redeem the Semitic peoples. And Boaz was used to redeem the messianic line. There is a method to what is coming from your bodies. There is a reason that God chose you. There is a reason that motherhood is the most apprised thing in God's kingdom. In fact, 
This is how he made his entrance into the world. What should that tell us? 30 generations and the first and the 10th always started something. The first seven uses of the word toliadot. In Genesis 2, 4, toliadot is used. The earth in the original man. The generations of the earth in the first man. In Genesis 5, the generations of the fallen man. In Genesis 6, the generations of the redeemed man. In Genesis 10, the generations of the nations. In 11, of the Semitic peoples. In 25, of the family of faith. And in Genesis 36, of the nation of God. God builds through generations. He builds His story. He, he builds the human race. And He builds His plan of redemption through generations. He's building something through you. Your lives are not meaningless. The diaper changing is not meaningless. When they become teenagers and you start to lose your hair every time they leave the house because you don't know what's going to happen. What will they do with their autonomy? It must be how God felt when He put Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, theologically, I don't know at what point how old Adam was when he sinned. But I know it was when mine became teenagers that they denied my existence and rebelled. So I'm just going to guess that he was a teenager. I'm obviously joking. My point is, is that if we can stir up a righteous zeal for raising up generations, we have a chance to change the world. Last one that I want to show you, and then we're going to go uh, in a totally different direction. These are the 12 sons of Israel in their birth order as told by their mothers. In other words, I have their mother's comment and their name. Leah says, the Lord has seen my misery. Behold, a son, one who hears, has joined. Praise the Lord, a vindication in the struggle, favor, fortune, and troops, a happy reward, a dwelling place. He has added the son of the right hand. You can't make this stuff up. That's the order that they were born in and the source material for you to find it. My point is, is he's telling a beautiful story through your generations. David, Jennifer, do you have a child that wasn't healed miraculously? I mean, how, when we look around the church, when we see little Riley or we see Christopher or we see so many, what we see is God's faithfulness. None of that is possible without a righteous woman wanting to have a child. And in a day when most people would rather have a second BMW in a bigger house, it's never been more important. I want to show you a photo. This is an artist's rendition of the Tower of Babel. See, when you build something like the Tower of Babel, it's a very interesting thing. The earthly base has to be large. It supports the next successive layer, which is, of course, smaller. Every generation living within the borders of the previous producing an ever-simplifying structure. It rises quickly. But ultimately, there's only one superstar at the top. The problem with this is this has been done all around us. Who is the greatest Methodist to have ever lived? John Wesley. Who's the greatest Baptist to have ever lived? Any group that we pick, the greatest among them was somebody who went before them. And every generation is living in something smaller than the previous generation. They're living within the borders of the revelation. They're living within the borders of the work. Jesus takes this model and he turns it upside down. Let's go to that next slide. He starts with one man and he begins to stir him so that every generation that comes from him is bigger than he was. The point here is that our children go beyond us, that our spiritual children go beyond us, that in every generation the influence grows and reaches the rest of the world. Abraham had one child. How many did Isaac have? How many did Jacob have? Do you see what's happening here? They're growing. They're growing in their influence. Abraham struggled to keep his family right. But by the time we're Jacob, 
We have a whole nation. If we can make it to two and three and four and five generations, we will change the world. And mamas, it is always, always started with you. No matter how godly your husband is, no matter how anointed he is. The very first thing that God said to Adam, he was completely incapable of doing. Be fruitful and multiply. Where was Eve? She not created till the next chapter. In Genesis 2.18, he says, it's not good that, that man is alone. I will make for him a helper. God told Adam to do something he could not do. Kind of like telling you, be holy. Then he gave him a helper. So that what he could not do alone, they could do together. This is a godly family. We help each other rise to something that we could never do alone. We are better together. We minister together. We love together. We raise our children together. We are together. And our children will learn togetherness from us. They'll learn fellowship from us. The last image that I have for you, that I'm just trying to make the impression, is how you build a strong oak tree. The central ring that starts everything, like Father Abraham, it's, it's right in the center, it's the bullseye. It nails the heart of the faith. But every bit of growth that comes after that is bigger than he experienced it. Every ring of growth. The point is, is what we're wanting is to stir something up that gets ever bigger and bigger and bigger in the generations to come. And we don't do that by filling up mega churches. We do it, we do it by filling up hearts and lives. There would be no point in getting 10 miles wide if we're getting successively more and more shallow. What we must do is be of the substance of Abraham, but take his work further and further and further and further. Jesus has stirred us up, and now we are going to carry that into the generations to come. Something is said that is amazing in Acts 13. I'm going to do this quickly. 1336. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. David completed his purpose. Is that incredible? When Jesus entered Jerusalem, do you know what they called him? A son of David. Which one was bigger? The first man or the last man? What David began and showed us... Uh, a, a symbol of Jesus was the reality of this is the way it builds through the generations if you complete your purpose then those coming after you will be better than you you shouldn't have to wait for somebody to die to preach behind this pulpit you're being prepared in every way to minister here there and everywhere and you will do it far better than any of us because you have our experience to start with Oh man, you learn that from the sacrifice of a mother. You eat literally from her body. She changes your clothes. She puts you to sleep. She wakes you up. She is there holding your hand while dad's at work when you learn to walk. And her whole goal is that she raises somebody even more capable than her. That is the heart of Christianity. That is the soul of Christianity. In Revelation 22, when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, he is the beginning of this process. He is the end of this process. He began it in your generations, and he who began the good work will bring it to completion. I'd like to invite Elder Baj here. As Elder Baj is walking here, I want to read to you Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, hear these words, 
through all generations. All. That started somewhere and it must go somewhere. Elder Buzz is going to help us with where it started. Amen. Who wants to be stirred up in the house today? Amen. Amen. Tara, sweetheart, could you please put um, Luke one thirty nine up there? Stir it up in the house today, saints. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. And 40, please. Where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Keep it going, please. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Is it possible not to be stirred when you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're in the presence of Jesus? Is it possible? No. So we see an example of John the Baptist being close to Jesus, and he was stirred. He was stirred up just by being in the presence of Jesus. Oh, that is wonderful. Luke one fifteen. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Some versions say he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even in the mother's womb. Amen. So let me encourage you moms and dads in this house today. If you don't have a child and you're praying for a child, pray for the child even now. Yeah. Pray like you believe you're going to have one. If you're pregnant in this house, talk to your child. Pray for your child. Ask God to feel a child even now in the womb with the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to do that. He'll do that. It is entirely possible, as we can see, that this child be born already filled with the Holy Spirit. How, how incredible would that be? <laughs> we, we are seeing little children that are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why not take it a step further and actually ask God to do it before they're born? Would that be amazing? Amen. Amen. All right, so... I want to pick up a little bit more on the, uh, on the generation theme. And so with that, let's go to Gen Genesis 18, verse 19. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. This is a promise that the Lord is giving Abraham. And this is not a suggestion that the Lord is making to Abraham. He's saying Abraham will command his family. He will direct yeah. his family. I researched this a little bit further. In the Septuagint, it says that Abraham will order his family. Order his family. This word in the Hebrew, order, it, it translates to shalom. So that Abraham would teach his children to be in right order with God and right order with man. Amen. And this is the way that this would take place. The paleo says, the revelation of a secure tra uh, trail. The revelation of a secure trail. This is what you are forming for your family and for the generations that are coming. You are, you are forging revelation from God that secures your trail in His service. Amen. This is the goal. In Numbers 32, 13, we can see that there was a whole generation lost in the wilderness. A whole generation because they were not directed in the, in the proper way. We're not going to do this. Amen. We're not going to do this in this house. Uh, what we're going to shoot for is obedience to the Lord and we're going to bring generations behind us up so that they achieve so much more than we have. Amen. And, it, and it'll continue in perpetuation from here on out. And what, what that'll result in is salvation for the nations. Yeah. When we do this, it causes the order in our lives to happen on a daily basis. This order that we're striving for, the shalom, when in obedience we are receiving the revelation from God and we are acting on it and we're doing what He says, this causes order to happen in our lives. It is the only way to do it. This is not a suggestion. This is a command by God. You either do this and you succeed, or you fail, and your life will, uh, will effectively cease spiritually. 
So it cannot happen unless we are obedient to God and do exactly what he says. What this will eventually result in is a nation of priests. So just like Moses and Joshua, we are to take some of the goodness, some of this spiritual power that the Lord has given us and place it on our sons yeah. and let them run filled with the Holy Spirit and achieve much higher things than we have. This is the way it happened as a pattern in the Bible. Amen. And it's evident all over the place. If we are to do this, a key ingredient is going to be holiness. Amen. All right. So as we live, we have to live holy. I just want to encourage anybody in here that is, uh, is not included in regular fellowship. Okay? A man cannot survive in the spiritual world by himself. Okay? You might think that doing your church on Sunday morning is fine by yourself in your living room. Uh, you might think that, oh, I pray and I read my Bible. But you see, the thing about it is your integrity is going to be shown based on what you do by yourself in your own living room, in your own bedroom. Okay? So what's happening there? What is happening when no one's watching? I would challenge you on a daily basis, if possible all day, which is what we strive to do, to be in fellowship, to be in accountability to somebody or to multiple people or to large groups of people, even better. When we hang out, we hang out 10, 15 strong. This is a good way to remain holy because we cannot afford to step back even one day away from fellowship and trust ourselves that we can remain pure. We need our brothers to be around us. Amen. Uh, could you please put up Leviticus 20, 26? You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. Amen. And I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. So the Lord has taken us and he has separated us, made us holy. We're striving to be holy. We are supposed to look apparently different to those that don't know him. And how we live is going to demonstrate this. Okay? Our holiness is what should either attract people to us because they like it or viciously repel them from us because uh, it, it, it smells bad to them. <laughs> one way or the other. If we look at uh, the story of uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu, they had a small slip. A little slip. They lit some fire, and it was unholy to the Lord, and it cost them their lives. One, one slip. We can't afford to slip one day, okay? even, even one hour, if we're pushing the wrong buttons on that computer. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. Amen. Thank you, Tara. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Let me just pause right there for a second. If we're living holy lives, the result of that will be that we can and are able to be in communion, in communion with God. Okay? Yeah. It works two ways. Comfort. So we are able to be in communion with God. And the other thing that happens is that other people will see the Lord by our holiness, and it will attract them. I mean, if we're ambassadors of Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, if we are these ambassadors, we have to look a certain way to attract people to the kingdom. Okay, We are going to be different, and we're going to be holy, so that we can stay in communion, and other peoples can be brought to Christ through us. Amen. Carry on, please. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. One little slip, one bowl of soup, and he lost everything. So did he have an opportunity? In this case, he didn't. Maybe you won't. We don't know. Stay holy. You can't Amen. afford to make mistakes uh, that will cost not only you, but generations behind you to suffer. 
Can you, can you imagine just doing the math? If one man falls and everything that comes behind him, it's, uh, it's astronomical. I mean, it's exponential. The, the numbers, when you branch this family out, it's so much at stake and we can't afford it. Carry on, please. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. It's tragic. So we need to stay accountable. We need to stay in fellowship because this is one way that we're going to show. But let me encourage you. I see a lot of this in the church. And yeah. it is obvious to me Amen. That, uh, that those that are not in fellowship are having a difficult time advancing, even, even though they've been called by God. But, I, but I'm encouraged by this group because I see that uh, more or less universally throughout this group. I love what I'm seeing. I love what's happening. I, w- I want to encourage you, especially you moms. The Lord will answer your prayer. We- we've seen it so many times. Amen. The babies will come. It might take you a year. It might take you seven years. Right, Dangs? But the Lord will answer your prayers. And He is faithful. Amen. Amen. Elder Charlie. Amen. Amen. You know, righteousness, holiness, and faith, it starts somewhere, right? Yeah. And it's to be passed on through you. You know, I have always preached, I mean from years and years, that You only leave two things behind when you leave this earth. Number one is what you have allowed God to accomplish through your life here on earth. That's right. And number two is what you have invested in your children. If that's good or if it's bad, that's what we'll leave behind you. Right? But it this this generation to generation is passed on and it is Mother's Day I want to talk about that you know my mom she's 87 something like that but she instilled in me the morals and the standards that I live today amen um, and she was always there when I had a problem. If I was right or if I was wrong, she was always there. You know, <clears throat> uh, I want to look at, at uh, Second Kings ver- uh, chapter 4, verse 19, we'll start. <clears throat> and we're talking about the Shunammite woman here. <laughs> I love this story, and there's so many things, uh, factors of blessings we can get out of this. You know? <clears throat> um, I think I'm there. Let's see. Verse 19, I say. Here we go. We're talking about, if you know the story, the story is that she couldn't have a child, and God blessed her with a child. And she was close to the man of God, Elijah. Matter of fact, she built a a room for him to come and visit. And she visited the man of God regularly. So look what happens. In uh, verse 19, if I can find it again. I need to borrow past the glasses, I guess. Um, (laughs) My head, my head. He said, the son did, to the father. His father told the servant to carry him to his mother. <laughs> did he, did he call, take, him, say, take him to the emergency room? <laughs> did he Google it just to see what, what was wrong with this kid? 
No, he said, take him to his mother. <clears throat> because he knew how strong and how faithful the mother was. Now listen in verse 20. It says, after the servant has lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. Man. Now this, this is everything that she ever wanted was a son, her only child. And he died. But look what she did. She went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God. Amen. Then she shut the door. And she went out. Where'd she take him? She took him to the place that she met with God. And we and the ladies in this room, I know, have a place that you meet with God regularly. Amen. Amen. Let's skip down to verse 30. But the child's mother said to Elijah, now she, was, she went and met with the man of God, and she was telling him his, her problem. And this is what she said. But the child's mother said, as sure as the Lord lives and, has, and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and he followed her. The faith, the love, and the determination of that mother turned the heart of the man of God. Amen. To answer her prayer. Your mother's in here standing in the gap for you. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> Now, if we look in Acts, we look in Acts um, chapter 12. Acts 12, verse 12. Well, give me a minute. Ah, we're getting there. I'm not left-handed. <clears throat> Verse 12. <laughs> and we're talking about Paul here. I mean Peter. I'm sorry. We're talking about Peter here. And it says, when, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, called Mark. You remember this guy, John Mark? Yeah. His ministry didn't start off real well. But he ended up, he ended up serving Paul and serving and ministering and writing a book in the New Testament. Amen. But he went to um, Mary, the mother of John Carl Mark, where many people were gathered together and they were praying. Now, think about this. What made Peter go to this house? Why didn't he go to his own mother's house? Well, well how did he know to go there? It's because this mother had people praying regularly Amen. in her house. Amen. This mother, standing in the gap, not only for her own children, but for Peter Come on. in prison. <clears throat> and from that faith and that love passed down to generation came a mighty man of God yeah. named Mark. Yeah. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> now... I want to look in Isaiah. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah 54, 1. It says, Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child. Burst in the song and shout for joy, you who were never in labor. 
Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who had a husband. Has any of you in here ever been mothered by a spiritual mother? And weren't you all? Yeah, I have. Man. So this is this scripture telling us that you don't have to have children of your own to be a mother and a blessing. You know, my mom. <laughs> I used to run with some guys. I wasn't always saved. <laughs> Did you believe that? I wasn't born that way. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys I used to run with, well, they were literally convicts. Hoodlums, as they used to call it in Louisiana. <clears throat> I can't believe we didn't know each other. <laughs> <laughs> but... But we would come in, me and these guys, we'd come into my mom's house at like 2 or 3 in the morning. And she'd get up and meet us. She'd make sure we had something to eat. She'd sit us down and talk about our problems and what to do about them. And every one of these guys, even though very few of them are alive today, but every one of these guys would tell me, I wish I had a mother like yours. Come on. You know, <clears throat> I always said that I want to be like my mom when I grew up. Well, I didn't quite, hadn't quite made it there yet. But Joel and I. Amen. You know, her Joel. greatest, her great, Joellen's greatest <clears throat> ambition and desire and sacrifice is to train up her children in a way that they should go. Amen. And they go further than we do. Yes. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, when uh, Caleb moved to El Paso, I think it was, when he was, was helping start a church there, and my mom told me, she said, she kind of chuckled, she said, you know, in God, amazing how he takes our children and calls them to accomplish the things we could only dream of. Mm. Right? That's the goal. That's the generation to come. We think about <clears throat> uh, Timothy. Paul noticed the faith of Timothy because he's seen it. He had seen it in Timothy's grandmother, passed down to his mother, passed down to him. And that same faith and that same word is still blessing us today. It is. Came from grandma. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and I'm going to close with one more scripture. Here is Proverbs 31. Uh, verse 29 to 31. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Amen. And mothers, we praise you today. We do. We congratulate you. Because we can't do this without you. Amen. Well, uh, Amen. Amen. Stay with me. As we get ready to have the baby dedication, we just want to tell you right now uh, that it's our heart's cry as the Sutherland family. We want to equip you. We want to come alongside of you and help you to do this. Uh, Pastor Matt, we have... It is, it is our greatest desire. The Lord put me on this planet, gave me the family that he gave so that we could support you as you're raising up generations, as you are going forward so that we can help you do this together. Amen. The Biros want to propel you into his presence. Now, a Romanian proverb uh, fits true with the word propel, and that is a kick in the rear is a step forward. So what you encounter here at Life Change of Ministries is a propelling into God's presence because future generations depend on it. 
And not only do we want you to achieve your call as we propel you into his presence, we Amen. want to train you how to propel others into his presence for the same purpose. Amen? Amen. We'd like to invite the families down uh, who are dedicating babies today. Come on down here to the front. I know you guys are, many of you are standing in the back. I want to invite you on down now. You don't have to be afraid that they're going to cry. They're coming down and we all see it. This is family time. Come on down. Yeah. Let's line up across yes. the whole front of the stage. <laughs> oh my the miracles. <laughs> Joseph. Come on, Marlon. You know, looking at this group like this, especially the men and the women, it's really proof that... Uh, beautiful wife and an ugly husband make a beautiful baby. That's all right. <laughs> We're going to do some quick pictures here. We're going to start off in alphabetical order with the Arius family. We'll have uh, the next slides here. This is Tobias Emmanuel Arius, <laughs> born on July 21st. <laughs> <Woo! laughs> Abigail and Rebecca and Nicole are the siblings, so if we'll do a couple of the pictures here. <laughs> what a yes. beautiful family. Yeah. Tobias, one month old. Oh, uh -huh. Lord. Those cheeks, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's Happy good. little guy. I love that. Uh, where are the dangs? Here they are right behind us. We have John and Joy. This is Esther Grace. Yes. <laughs> Baby sister Sarah. She, this, <laughs> this beautiful family gave birth on Thursday morning. And we're in church. Come on, that's LCM Strong right there. That, that is strong right there. We have pictures of Esther Grace. First time in Sarah's arms. This is where Sarah gets to meet her sister for the first time. Beautiful picture there. And then a beautiful picture of this family. We love you, Dangs. So from a family who had to pray for over, for over six years to receive their first child, did not look like they were going to have one. They now have two beautiful little girls. Yeah. Come on. Next, we have Spencer and Caitlin McLean. We have Spence. Riley, baby sister. This is Eva Salome McLean. She's like, yeah, I'm here now. Uh huh. Let's go ahead and do a couple of the pictures. What a, what a beautiful picture of the family. We have little Eva there. Uh huh. <laughs> So cute. Uh huh. Happy, smiling. Amen. We next we're gonna dedicate Ezra Abner Reyesora. Yes. Chris and jo you even got a haircut, huh? Yeah. Look how good you look. Okay. The Reyesoras come right out of a little stamp mold. <laughs> Chris and Joy, with Ethan, Jonah, and Cameron, born on May 16th, 2017. Is that right? Okay, good. All right, we're going to look at some pictures. Uh-huh, cuteness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The, the dreamy pose there. I love it. Got Cookie Monster. Here, go back to mom. Is that okay? Or are you going to stay with me? No, okay, he's going to stay with me. Okay. Here, you just hold that. Um... Next, we have Zadok, Asa Smith, Come on. Daniel, and Randy. <laughs> Come on, another family that wasn't supposed to have any kids, and now we have two sons. I'm just saying, we got two sons, we got two daughters. Okay, I'm just saying. Born on February 26th. What a beautiful, beautiful family. Take a look at some of these pictures. Man, what a good-looking family. Yeah. Uh-huh. Take a look. <laughs> it's the bow tie is killing me. I love this. All right, well, you just keep holding it. Next, we have Marlon and Lena with Come their on. little son, Daniel Alexander. Hey, Daniel! Come on, we're seeing healings in this family. We're seeing a family who's been desiring to, to find out what family is all about, what asking of the Lord. And they came on a Sunday, if I, believe, if I remember the story correctly. Yeah. That pastor was teaching on toxic masculinity, on true manhood. 
The next week we talked on um, heart-turning superpowers of, of women. Building families, that's what we are doing here. We build one, we change one life at a time. We build the families that reach the nations. Amen. Take a look at a couple of the pictures we have here. Isn't that cute? <laughs> look at that. Uh-huh. So sweet. Oh. Mm, I'm thinking. He's trying to think of which verse he wants to share with us. <laughs> Amen. Next we have Benaya Othniel Stevens. From Judah and Sasha, brother Titus Magnus, born on January 18th. Let's take a look at a couple of pictures here. A snowy day. A snowy day. <laughs> look at that guy. Uh huh. Close up. <laughs> happy, happy, happy little guy. We love this. And next we have, I believe, we have Yusef Ibrahim Zachary. Born on August 23rd. Let's take a look at a couple of pictures there. What a <laughs> cute little couple. Our yeah, Swiss Egyptian family. Hey, that's, that's not him yawning. That's a roar coming out. That's ah, a little I rhyme see. is what that is. Zafanov Panea. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. We'll stop right there on those pictures. Man. What we want to share with you. This is all we get to be a part what of we want to do is share with you today. Um, just very, very quickly some verses about what our heart is. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 38, we see Mary and Joseph. And what you hear is you hear Mary's reply to the Lord. I am the Lord's servant. One of the things that we must acknowledge as parents, for each of us here standing, let me see if I can give them over to you. It's hard to hold a baby that long on your side. I'm, 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 a little, I'm, I'm cramping up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> What we see here is that Mary's words to the Lord. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Parents, there's nothing more important than us understanding that we, as parents, when we're parenting, we are actually serving the Lord. Yeah. Somehow in our culture, we have women who think that if they're taking care of children, that they are not ministering. That's crazy. The very scripture of God lays out very clearly, Mary understood that her service to the Lord was how well she parented. Yeah. The same applies to us. Our highest call, if we are going to reach the generations, ladies, you have to understand that this is your first, this is your primary responsibility, is to represent the Lord, both to your husband and to your children. And it is an act of service, a powerful act of service. It feels like you're in the back somewhere when you're having to deal with crying babies. This is a service unto the Lord. It is not keeping you from service to the Lord. That's and we right. want you to understand that very deeply. This is your service. Amen. And if you get that straight, it will change so many things in our lives that this is part of our service to the Lord. In Judges chapter 13, we see Samson's father and we see Samson's mother. Hey Amen. Don't worry about the crying. We're, this, is, this is a baby dedication. There should be crying, right? That's right. Yeah, I know. Sounds hey, like a service I anywhere know, else in the I world. Know, I know. Manoah, the an angel of the Lord, comes to Samuel's mother, to Manoah's wife, and begins to share with her. Anybody ever had a, your wife that the Lord spoke to something them first? Spoke to them first, and you're like, wow. What she does is Manoah's wife takes it to Manoah and says, what is going on? Oh, there's a, something special about the son that is to be born. And in verse 8, it says this, then Manoah prayed to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I beg you, let the man of God that you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. I heard something similar when I talked to Marlon the first time. He was coming. Man, I, I want to know what it's like to raise a family of God. That what we do is not only understand that parenting is a service to the Lord, but that as we're doing this, we've got to ask for and accept the help from the Lord. From the body of Christ, we must continually go to the Lord so that we can rightly hear that we can rightly learn how to raise these kids. It's more than just a natural thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to reach the nations. We're trying to reach and build families that are strong and that can reach the ends of the earth. In 1 Samuel 28, I'll just reference it. Hannah, she's praying to the Lord and she understands that this child that God gave her, Samuel, is to be offered back to the Lord. Parents, our children... We have been blessed with the stewardship of our children, but our children's destiny, their purpose in life belongs to the Lord. That's right. We can never have our purpose as parents 
overwhelm what the Lord is trying to do in them. We must, like Hannah, be ready to give our all and give our children to the Lord. And lastly, you heard a passage that Elder Baj shared earlier today about Abraham raising his children and his household after him to serve the Lord. This is what we talk, this is what we teach as a church. This is what we find is important as a church for all of these beautiful families that we have right here. What we'd like to do at this point is read four vows that will direct your responsibility over your children. After each one, we would like for you guys to say yes. Will y'all do that? (laughs) So that makes it five now. Okay. Here we go. Like Mary and Joseph, will you view parenting as your service to the Lord? Oh, one more time. Get some oomph in. There we go. Scare the babies. (laughs) Number two. Like Manoah, (coughs) will you ask for and accept instruction from the Lord regarding training your child in righteousness? Yes. Yes. Amen. Number three. Like Hannah, will you yield your will for your child's life to God's will, acknowledging and acting as if their whole life belongs to the Lord? Yes. Yes. Amen. Finally. Will you train them through your actions and discipleship to love the Lord with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength? Yes. Yes. Amen. Come on, church, would you stand with us?